Good evening. Welcome to this uh, session of Astro Adda, uh, organized by Nehru Planetarium, Nehru Memorial Museum and Library, and the Public Outreach and Education Committee, Astronomical Society of India. We are here today to go on a journey to view the invisible sun. And uh, you will know what are the wavelengths where this invisibility becomes visible. And not just visible, sun shares some secrets with us through the innovative instrumentation um, uh, which the group of our speaker today, uh, Professor Divya Oberoi from the National Center for Radio Astrophysics, which runs and maintains the JN Meter Wave Radio Telescope. So that gives you the hint about what are these wavelengths where the invisibility becomes even secret to you. So uh, thank you, Divya, for... Uh, uh, well, agreeing to reveal the secrets yeah. to us and so <laughs> i will hand over to you to tell uh, the participants about the sun and perhaps a little bit also about the innovative instrumentation which has revealed sure, yeah. secrets from the sun yeah sure yeah. thanks uh, a lot uh, 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 please um, go ahead yeah I just I just wanted to tell the participants um yeah that uh, from now onwards if you would just uh, uh, keep the chat to put your questions because if we have many hi hello messages after this they will cloak the questions and I find it difficult then to retrieve the questions at the end because it doesn't scroll back very much so all the participants use the chat for all your questions and only for your questions for now I'll hand over to you Divya thank you so I'll much, add your uh, presentation into the yeah sure uh, yeah i will go to the presentation mode here yeah. okay yeah thanks a lot uh Ratnishri. Um, it's really happy to have the opportunity to share what i have to say with all of you uh like Ratnishri said i've titled it the invisible sun by that i really mean that we'll be talking about things which we don't usually see with our own eyes I'm not focusing too much on uh, instrumentation in this talk. I'm really more interested in giving you a sense for how much more the sun is as compared to what our eyes would uh, allow us to see. Okay. So uh, like Ratnishri said, uh, please post your questions on the chat and I would take them at the end. And I uh let me begin let let's begin however by talking a little bit about the visible sun first right so that is something which is very familiar to us right it's there every day in the sky at least when it's not cloudy uh and i don't advise you to look at the sun but this is what a picture of the visible sun would usually look like right it's a largely featureless disk of the sun and occasionally you will have maybe some small spots and sometimes larger spots which would appear and that's something we would talk about a lot more as we go along to give you a sense for its size the radius of the sun is about seven times ten to the power eight uh, in units of meters it's roughly around 100 times larger than the sun somewhat surprisingly the mass of the sun is also about a million times that of the earth uh, so, uh, which means that roughly the density of the sun and earth are very similar. The distance between the sun and the earth, you know, it takes light roughly eight minutes to travel that distance. It's about 150 million kilometers. If you were to measure it in the units of the radius of the sun itself, it's about 214 solar radii, right? Uh, the yellow color of the sun comes from the fact that its effective temperature is about 5,800 Kelvin, right? So it's really hot. Uh, it's luminosity. This luminosity is simply the energy which the sun is giving out in the entire electromagnetic spectrum. It's quite an impressive number. It's about 4 times 10 to the power 26 watts. Okay, And as you know, sun is really the the engine which powers life on Earth. And that is being done by this about 1.4 kilowatts of energy being incident on the surface of the earth i should not say surface of the earth actually this is above the atmosphere of the earth that is the amount of of energy which is being incident on the on the earth because of the sunlight right 1.4 kilowatts per meter square in terms of its age the sun is a sort of middle-aged star about 5 billion years old 
for those of you who know something about stellar classification, it's a G2 star, okay? That's, the classification is a way of sort of telling you uh, how hot the star is and how much energy it is uh, putting out, okay? Okay, very good. So uh, let's take also a little, uh, a quick look at the internal structure of the sun, all right? That's again a part, I mean, this sort of invisible to us because we really don't get any sense for what is beneath the surface of the sun, which is visible to our eyes. So at the very center, uh, as you all probably know, is what is called the core of the sun, which is really the hottest part of the sun at temperatures of about 15 million Kelvin or so. And that is where the nuclear reactions where the hydrogen fuses to form helium and the tiny difference in mass is radiated out as energy. That is where these reactions are taking place. So out of the core are being emitted photons at the gamma ray energies. Right? As these guys come out of the core, they come into a region which is referred to as the radiation zone. And there they interact with the very dense material which is uh, present there. And they slowly get these photons, uh, they get scattered to lower and lower wavelengths. And they really slowly random walk their way out. Uh, let me get my cursor out from somewhere here to all the way till here, right? And this random walk is a really slow process, so slow that even for a photon, it takes hundreds of years to, uh, after it has been emitted from the core, to really cross this radiation zone. Uh, this zone is called radiation zone because the most efficient way of transport of energy across this zone is via radiation. The next zone which these photons hit is something called the convection zone. And it's called, it, it, uh, as the name would suggest, this is a zone where now the most efficient mode of energy, transport of energy has changed from radiation to convection. And what is happening here really is that these photons, which have slowly uh, been uh, transported down to lower and lower energies have become ultraviolet photons. They are now actually being absorbed by the material which is there. As this material absorbs these photons, it becomes hotter. Hotter things in a fluid tend to rise. That sets up the convection. And that is what is shown here by these sort of cells which are marked here. And as uh, they've tried to show in this figure, there are multiple layers of these uh, convection cells which are set up. So on top of these first tier of convection uh, cells is the next tier, which is referred to as the supergranules. On top of that is yet another layer. And then on top of that sits what we call the photosphere, the, the yellow disk of the sun. Uh, that's not the end of the story. On top of the photosphere sits another thin layer, about a thousand kilometers or no, no, sorry, about 10,000 kilometers thick, which is called the chromosphere. And beyond that is what is uh, referred to as the corona. And uh, uh, these are essentially the layers, the photosphere, the chromosphere, and the corona, which we will talk about uh, as we go along in our journey today, because uh, I'll be talking only about the electromagnetic radiation, which we receive from the sun. And that is where this radiation comes from. Okay. Okay. So uh, I'd already mentioned sunspots, right? These are on the visible disk. They appear as dark patches. Uh, they have been known for a long time. I'm showing you uh, a, actually a sketch made by Galilei, Galileo Galilei on the left. And another one by Shiner, who was uh, a contemporary of Galilei, uh, on the right. And the sketch on the right really uh, tries to explore the morphology of sunspots. And he did a lot of detailed work uh, about how these dark patches evolve. How, what do they start? What do they look like when they start? How do they morph during their lifetimes and so on and so forth? So you can see there's a lot of, you know, really complicated diagrams which he drew. And all of this was just by looking at the sun through a telescope using colored glass, using some darkened glass. And later a studio of, uh, a student of Galileo, sorry, uh, he developed the technique to project an image of the sun 
onto a piece of cloth or a wall or something. And then they started a much more detailed study. So I would really encourage you to look at this website, the Galileo Project. It has really uh, very interesting historical information about how this uh, uh, started to be. In fact, humans had been observing the sunspots well before the telescope was invented. The, the first uh, known record of what might be sunspots comes from something like 500 BC. And it's from some Chinese, uh, uh, I want to say inscriptions. Okay. Okay. But certainly for the past many hundred years, so more than 300 years, we have been gathering really detailed information about these sunspots. And I'll come to that a bit later. But let's first take a look at what is our current understanding of sunspots, right? So uh, as you've already realized or you already probably knew that sunspots appear as dark patches on the surface of the sun, which would right away lead you to uh, believe that these must be colder than the neighboring regions, right? And that is in, in fact correct. While most of the sun is at about 5,800 Kelvin, the sunspots themselves are at about 4,500 Kelvin, right? So good 1,500 or so uh, degrees cooler than that. What they are also now known to be are the regions where the magnetic field is erupting from beneath the surface of the sun. Okay, And magnetic field, as you know, is always closed, right? There is no end of a magnetic field. It's always a loop. So if a magnetic field has to erupt from the surface of the sun, it also has to go back, right? So therefore, uh, when you look at even the most detailed images of sunspots, you always find that they appear in pairs. Okay. Now, here in the cartoon, which was here, it seemed like a very symmetric uh, thing that naturally as much magnetic flux as is appearing uh, or is bursting out of the photosphere at one place must get back into the photosphere at some other place. But there's no reason why this should happen symmetrically. In the simplest sunspots, of course, that's the way it would be. There is a sort of north polarity and a south polarity, and both of them are next to each other, and the field comes out from one and enters into the other. But in real life, what you often find is that uh, even though the sunspots uh, appear in pairs, they can they they're not really uh, they don't look symmetric when you look at them and in fact uh, sunspots are always found to have a darker region at the center which uh, is named umbra and the fainter outer region which is called penumbra and those names simply are uh, reflections of history because uh, a long time ago these sunspots were assumed to be shadows of other planets or some other things floating around uh, the sun. And because the shadows have umbra and penumbra associated with them, that is how they got named and the name still continues. In reality, what is happening now, and this is a really detailed picture, a high resolution picture of the surface of the sun taken uh, by a Japanese satellite by the name Hinode. Uh, this dark region is really the place where the magnetic field is coming out vertically from the sun. And the regions where the magnetic field has significant inclination to our line of sight is what is appearing as these uh, penumbral regions. And if you look at it closely, you will find that it is it is clear that it is made up of many fibrils, right? So you can actually see details of some magnetic structure in an uh, image like this already. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the fact that the the sizes of these regions are very different already tells you that the magnetic field density across these regions must be uh, quite different as well. If all the magnetic field which is coming out of here has to get back into these uh, smaller regions, naturally the field here must be much denser than the field which is in here. Okay. Okay. Uh, now we also have the ability to actually uh, image what these things look like at many, many other wavelengths. This earlier picture was a white light or optical uh, image. Here I'm showing you an image made uh, at ultraviolet wavelengths. And now you can see actually that all these loops of magnetic field, which uh, I was talking about, they're really being lit up in this uh, uh, ultraviolet image. How that comes to be is again something uh, which we will see as we go along. Naturally, uh, you can't see the magnetic field, right? It must be something else which is allowing you to uh, actually see this. 
and that's a mystery we'll take a look at as we go okay okay so, uh, because we had already been looking at these sunspots for centuries now it has been known for a long time that these the appearance and disappearance of these sunspots actually follows a cycle which is referred to as a solar cycle so uh, this has again i mean uh, uh, this time series actually goes back even earlier in history to uh, i think earlier records are from something like 1650 or so another 100 years or so uh, prior to this and what you on what you see here on the y axis is some measure of a count of the total number of sunspots which were there on the sun and as you can see it sort of comes down and goes up and comes down and goes up and keeps doing that over and over again but what you also notice is that even though this is making these wave sort of things different oscillations in this quantity are quite different sometimes the peaks can be quite low other times the peaks peaks can be quite high sometimes the peaks are wider sometimes the peaks are very sharply defined sometimes you almost feel like you have multiple peaks right some something like here or here or actually much more prominent pronounced here and if you were to look at either say the distance between subsequent peaks or the distance between subsequent valleys you find that the number varies between say 9 and 14 years or so and if you were to do some sort of a mean the number is around uh, close to around 11 and that is what is referred to as the duration of a solar cycle okay now uh, okay this is what uh, uh, another representation of the solar cycle is here the numbers which are shown here they are actually they seem like very smooth lines right but in what i'm showing here these lines are much more jagged and the smooth line is a monthly average which is sort of passing through them and the point of showing this particular slide is just to say that actually uh, even though on an average these things very smoothly uh if you were to look at on an individual day or a week the day to day fluctuation or a week to week fluctuation can actually be quite large okay so these sunspots have can have lifetimes from a, uh, a few days to many weeks but their appearance and disappearance can still be quite random okay okay now uh here is another aspect of the solar cycle so not only uh do these sunspots appear and disappear the place where they appear on the sun also undergoes very systematic variation so in the top panel again on the x axis is time and on the y axis is the latitude of the place where the sunspot appears right and for uh, obvious reasons this is known as the butterfly diagram okay so what i would like to draw your attention to is if you notice where this red line has appeared this is the sort of minima of the solar cycle right so the bottom panel shows the average uh, number of daily sunspots uh, or daily sunspot area so close to the minima is when these uh, uh, sunspots are actually as at the equator at the start of a new cycle the sunspots appear around latitudes of plus minus 30 or a little bit higher than that and as the cycle progresses they slowly move closer and closer and closer to the equator and they don't get closer than about few degrees to the equator and then the all the sunspots sort of slowly disappear or their number becomes very small and then all of a sudden again uh, the next cycle starts and these sunspots begin to appear at latitudes of around plus minus 35 or so and they begin their march downwards right so this uh, pattern has also been very steady and has been uh, noted for a uh, ever since we started to monitor the sunspot cycle or solar cycle now coming to things which we can't see with our uh, eyes the invisible aspects of the sun here is a set of pictures from again a japanese satellite by the name yoko these are now uh, taken in x ray band okay so uh, and we'll talk about this later as well these x rays uh, are sensitive to really very hot plasma okay plasma at about tens of millions of kelvin okay? and these what is shown in this picture is actually a set of 11 images so starting from here all the way back and then coming to the front okay at the very back is the solar minima and at the very front are the solar maxima and you see that as you, you you progress from one maxima towards a minima and then come back towards the next maxima uh 
the sun has many more features closer to the maxima. And at the minima, it's essentially a featureless uh, disk, or there is very little which is happening on the sun, at least as seen in these images. Okay. Here is another view, uh, again, organized in a similar manner. So the solar maxima are here, solar minima is here. This time it comes from a different satellite. Uh, and this is the view taken in the extreme ultraviolet uh, wavelengths. Okay? But here again, you see that at the minima, the sun is essentially featureless. And at the maxima, the sun is full of all sorts of uh, features. And we were just discussing that at the minima, essentially, there is hardly any sunspot left on the sun, while at the maxima, the sun has the largest number of uh, active regions or sunspots. So this ought, right away suggests to us that maybe the presence of these things, right, these bright active features at X-rays and in UV must have something to do with the presence of these active regions. Now, we also just talked about the fact that these active regions are got named sunspots because they were darker than the neighboring regions. So how come these regions, which are actually less energetic or seemed colder, darker in optical, how come they are turning out to be brighter at these much higher wavelengths? That's something which we will talk about as we go along. But uh, right now, I wanted to show you another aspect of the sort of invisible nature of the sun. Uh, this figure again is organized in the same manner. Solar maxima is here, one image per uh, year, and solar minima here. This is, however, an image not uh, drawn from radiation in the electromagnetic spectrum, but is a measure of the speed of the solar wind Okay, uh, as a function of the direction in which it is going. So what it is really showing you is the radial speed of the solar wind, no matter where it is coming from on the sun. Uh, the bright yellows, uh, sorry, the bright yellows here and the reds, they correspond to something like uh, 300 or so kilometers per second. And these bright blues are something like 800 kilometers a second. So you see that at the uh, solar minima, the speed of the solar wind, this very fast plasma which is flowing out from the sun, is organized like a belt of low speed solar wind. and uh, as you move out of this uh, belt, you get a lot of high speed wind which is flowing out. But as you come towards the maxima, this sort of beautiful pattern is not really maintained and you have uh, maybe small patches of fast solar wind, maybe sometimes at the poles, maybe sometimes away from the poles. But most of the sun seems to be covered by regions of low solar wind. Okay, So keep that in mind. Now, okay. There's uh, even though this image is actually taken, uh, is, a, is a white light image, right? The light which we can see with our eyes. But this is a part of the sun which usually remains invisible to us, right? This is the solar corona. It is, it is the extension of this corona which we were talking about just in the previous slide, the solar wind. Okay? Now, solar, uh, the corona is really the atmosphere the, of the sun. And we are unable to see it just because of the fact that the sun is so much brighter and the corona is so much fainter in, uh, in contrast that our eyes just don't have the sensitivity to be able to see. It. So we really have to wait for a solar eclipse to happen before we can see that. And here I'm showing you pictures taken from two different solar eclipses. One of these comes from close to a solar maximum, the one on the left, and the one on the right comes from close to a solar minimum. And on the, the figure on the right, a lot of image processing has been done to draw out these faint features which you see all around the sun. Okay? And also a little bit of cheating has been done that uh, they've put an image taken from a nearby time from a satellite at the center of the sun to sort of make it look beautiful. Okay, But what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that if you look at the image on the left, uh, sorry, if you look at the image on the right, yeah, you immediately notice that there is this very nicely well-organized structure which you are seeing uh, around the sun in the corona. And that reminds you of, of your bar magnet, right? That at the north and at the sound, south, there seems to be these field lines which are open just the way you would expect for, from your bar magnet. And this is a really very pronounced structure in this. 
there are other regions of closed magnetic fields as well, which are there all over the place. Some of them are larger, some of them are smaller, and there are other more complicated regions which are there. But there is this dominant structure of uh, open magnetic field lines coming out of the northern and the southern pole of the solar corona. If you were to look at the picture close to the solar maxima, you'd find that there is no such thing happening there, right? This is this looks like essentially uh, circularly symmetric, right? That the fields here or the fields there or the fields there, they seem to be similar. Uh, it would be impossible for you to look at this picture and find out where is the North Pole and where is the South Pole, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, here's another aspect uh, of the sun, which we are really not sensitive to with our eyes. This is again a measurement of the, of the solar wind uh, and <clears throat> solar wind and uh, at something like a distance of about one AU uh, at the dis earth sun distance or so. Okay, so the heliosphere is really defined to be the region uh, surrounding the sun, which is dominated by plasma of solar origin. Okay, and what I'm showing you here is data from a satellite by the name Ulysses. Now, uh, the really neat thing about Ulysses was that this satellite, for the first time, decided to get out of the ecliptic plane. The ecliptic ecliptic plane is the plane in which the Earth orbits the sun. And because most of the satellites we launch, they tend to be earth orbiting satellites we had only been looking at the sun from the vantage points all of them lying in the ecliptic plane so for ulysses what they decided to do is to launch it such that its its orbit would take it perpendicular to the ecliptic ecliptic plane so for the first time we would actually be able to pass over the poles of the sun and this is what uh, these guys found so what is shown here uh, is actually the speed of the solar wind in kilometers per second. What is shown by the color is the uh, orientation of the magnetic field, which was measured as the satellite was going around the sun. So red means the interplanetary magnetic field was pointed outwards, and blue means that it was pointed inwards. And here you see a reflection of the same thing which I was showing you earlier, that when you are close to the equatorial regions, you are in those so-called a uh, low speed belt, right? And the speeds here, so 500 would be something here, 1000 kilometers a here uh, is somewhere here. So you are sitting at maybe something like 350, 400 kilometers a second. Once you get out of the equatorial belt, this is what you see. And you are sitting at something like maybe 800 kilometers a second or so. And you can go all the way. The speed doesn't change very much in this region. But once you come here, it suddenly drops. It's much lower. It's also more structured. And if you were to look closely, say, uh, alongside these reds, sometimes in the middle, there is a, a bit of blue as well. And similarly, any region which you pick here alongside the blues, there is a little bit of red here as well. So even though there is a predominant magnetic field direction, occasionally you will find a magnetic field oriented in the other direction as well. Okay. Now, as it happened, Ulysses was uh, the, the timing of the mission was designed such that it would cover uh, more than a full solar cycle, actually. And the image which I was just showing you was this one, which the observations were uh, taken during the course of the solar minima, primarily. For the next orbit, we happen to be passing through now a solar maxima. And now you would find that the structure of the solar wind or the velocity which you see has suddenly changed, is dramatically different from what you had on the left, right? And here, like you were seeing in that uh, solar wind plot and also in the eclipse plot. So the speeds have become much more erratic. The speeds are all slower. Occasionally, you have a few high speed uh, streams, maybe close to the poles. Some of this high speed stream has still survived. Uh, but overall, the speeds have become much, much lower. Okay. okay. So all of these things, I want you to uh, uh, all of these are essentially evidence for the following, that A, sunspots have something to do with the magnetic fields. They are, in fact, the places where the magnetic field is erupting from the surface of the sun. Even though in optical, the sun does not seem to change much, if you look at the sun in various other wave bands, the sun, the appearance of the sun changes quite dramatically, and that those changes seem to be directly related to how 
uh, many active regions are present. Okay, and that is the theme which we will investigate as we go further. Okay? And so to be able to do that, I just want to tell you a little bit about the spectrum of the sun. Most of you, I uh, expect or assume are familiar with the concept of a black body, right? A black body is essentially just something which gives out uh, radiation across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. But of course, this radiation follows a particular pattern. It has a particular peak and where the peak lies depends on uh, the temperature of that black body. And that is really the only parameter which defines the spectrum of that body. And so stars, uh, they basically follow the or the emission from the stars is modeled very well or described very well by a, a black body spectrum. In reality, actually, the light which arrives on Earth, because it has to pass through the atmosphere, it is no longer uh, the same spectrum as what started out from the sun. And that's what's shown in this figure. The yellow is sort of what is emitted from the sun. And the red is what we receive on the Earth because the rest of it is absorbed uh, by our atmosphere. Right, And for our sun, the peak lies somewhere here in the yellow-green region of the eye. And it's, uh, it's an interesting fact that the sensitivity of the human eye also peaks in the yellow-green region of the spectrum because that is where the peak of the solar emission also lies. We, we believe that this is because of evolution, that uh, the sensitivity of human eye matches exactly the location of the peak of uh, solar emission. Okay. Uh, so if you were to actually look at the solar emission in just this regime, regime where the bulk of the energy from the sun is being uh, emitted, it does not change very much. That is, in fact, the reason why this, this energy, which is dominated by what is coming out of air, is, was referred to as a solar constant. Okay? In fact, it changes by less than 1.1% from a solar minimum to solar maximum. But if we were to look at some other parts of the spectrum, and I want to start by the higher energy part of the spectrum. Okay, So the red dashed line here is the black body spectrum. This is the uh, irradiance which has been measured at the top of the uh, atmosphere. Okay, This blue line refers to what you would actually measure. This comes from measurements. And this uh, green line uh, is meant to show you the variability right over an 11 year uh, period. So what this is, is really the maximum which was measured during a solar cycle. Subtract from that the minimum which was measured during that solar cycle and divided by the minimum. So max minus min divided by the min. And so that makes it some sort of a ratio of how much fractional variation can you expect. Okay, And it turns out that it is the, the fractional variability which you expect in the visible range, which is marked here, is really very tiny, right? It is sitting at somewhere here, 10 to the power minus 3, which is what I was saying is less than 0.1%. But as you come to these regimes, okay, this variability is very, very large. It can be as much as the value itself, okay? So at these high energy wavelengths, the uh, energy which is uh, being radiated from the sun can be extremely variable. Now, the other end of the spectrum which we want to look at is the radio regime, right? And so that is the same plot here, except that I have extended it to the radio regime. The wavelengths are now given here at the bottom in units of meters, okay? Now, you notice that the amount of energy which is being given out is dropping very dramatically as you go from close to the peak here to uh, meter wavelengths, let's say, right? And this fall is by uh, something like more than 20 orders of magnitude. So you would wonder why should one go to a regime like here where the amount of energy being output by the sun is so tiny to study the sun. And the answer to that is really very interesting. I'm drawing here uh, a few parallel lines to this uh, uh, 6,000 Kelvin curve. This one is at a million Kelvin, this one is at a billion Kelvin, and this one is at a trillion Kelvin, okay? What you find is that actually as you go to the uh, radio wavelengths, the spectrum of the sun is no longer defined by this black body, but it begins to become hotter and hotter and hotter. And by about a uh, wavelength of one meter or a frequency of 300 megahertz, it is closer to a spectrum of black body, which is at a million Kelvin. Okay, And then there is something which I'm calling the active sun, where uh, 
during these periods of solar activity, the emission of the sun can correspond to black bodies, which could be as high as temperatures of about 10 to the power 11, 10 to the power 12 Kelvin even, right? And what these are telling us are really interesting bits of information about the sun, which you could never have if you were looking at uh, just the optical spectrum of the sun, okay? So let's take a look at this animation, which tells you what the sun looks like as you proceed from the optical to higher up. Okay, so we've already hit about one and a half million Kelvin and now three million Kelvin. And I think that is the end. Let me play this again so that I can talk about it. So now notice where these active regions were and what happens uh, close to them as you go to higher and higher temperatures, right? It is showing you uh, something we just talked about a, a bit ago, that the places which were dark in the photosphere or on the visible disk of the sun, they seem to appear brighter and brighter and brighter as we go to higher and higher temperatures, okay? Let's take a, an image like this, which is, uh, it's not a movie, but it is showing you again the view of the sun in a large number of different wave bands, right? Uh, the first two I'll come to later, but where my cursor is, the, the third image in the top row is the visible light, sun seen in the visible light. This is uh, an image which is sensitive to a temperature of something like 4,500 Kelvin. So a little bit uh, colder than the... Uh, photosphere where which is at about 5800 kelvin and beyond that we go further as we go uh, uh, to next images of the sun these images are designed to be or these images are taken using filters which are at higher which are sensitive to plasma at higher and higher temperatures okay so this again is close to the is the photosphere uh, 6000 kelvin by about 10000 kelvin you are now seeing uh, the upper part of the photosphere. Uh, there's this part which I've not yet defined, which is called the transition region. This is the place uh, where the temperature of the plasma suddenly begins to shoot up from something like between five and 10,000 Kelvin in the photosphere region. It is shooting up to get close to a million Kelvin. And suddenly you see as you go beyond, beyond that, the regions which were close to these sunspots, which were visible in the uh, photosphere are turning out to be brighter and brighter and brighter. Okay, There are a few other things which I want you to notice from this. So for example, if you were to look at the photosphere, an image of the, the sun in, uh, at 6000 Kelvin, the edge of the sun, which, which is also called the limb of the sun, is very well defined right? You can draw a very sharp line and you say on one side of this is the sun and on the other side there is no sun. If you were to look at this image at a million Kelvin, you'll find that suddenly the limb of the sun, even though you can see the limb of the sun, it's fairly well defined, but on top of the limb of the sun sits very high, uh, sits plasma at a very high temperature at a billion Kelvin. That should be a bit of a surprise, right? Why is there, there this million Kelvin plasma all around? In fact, you can look at a couple of million, uh, a line sensitive to two million Kelvin, and you find that the same trend continues. It's only when you go to, say, significantly higher temperatures, you find that, okay, you're getting back to the, the sharply defined limb on the sun, even though you still find uh, plasma at really 10 million Kelvin, which is there everywhere, okay? So this really uh, is what is what I'm trying to show in this plot, where at the base of this is the photosphere, which is at uh, 5,600 Kelvin or so. On top of that sits the chromosphere. The x-axis here is height. And this thick curve is actually telling you the temperature of the sun on a log scale. At the end of the chromosphere, the temperature has risen to something like 10,000 or so Kelvin. And there is this transition region where over a region of something like a few hundred kilometers or actually less than a hundred kilometers, the temperature has changed from about 10,000 to almost a million Kelvin. Okay? And it continues to rise as we go further out in this coronal region. Okay? This is uh, actually also what is known as this coronal heating problem, right? The fact that this corona is sitting at a 2 million Kelvin while the photosphere is sitting at about uh, 6,000 Kelvin, how is that possible, right? We know that the heat always flows from a hotter body to a cooler body. But, and we know in this case that the heat must flow from the photosphere to the corona. 
but the photosphere is much cooler than the corona. So that clearly tells us that none of the standard ways of uh, transport of heat, right, conduction, convection, or radiation can be responsible for transporting this energy from the photosphere to the corona. So there must be some other mechanisms which are involved in uh, doing this, right? And so there are two well-known mechanisms or not I, sh I shouldn't call them well-known mechanism. There are two hypotheses uh, which people have put forth, which could potentially transport the energy from the base of the photosphere up to the corona. Okay. One of the uh, one of these hypotheses is that well, we know that this region is actually permeated by the magnetic fields. Okay, and and we know that there is convection in the corona. So all this convection in the corona is actually jiggling the foot points of these magnetic fields, which are emerging from all over the sun. Right? And as these, these magnetic fields are being jiggled by the convection, convective motions, some waves are being set up. And waves, as we know, can carry energy. And all you need to do is to put in enough energy in these waves, let them propagate out and then dissipate in the corona. And then all the energy which they have carried would now appear as heat in the corona. And so once people had this idea, we began to make more and more sensitive telescopes to look for these waves. And we have actually now found those waves. We've discovered these so-called alphanic waves, the waves in magnetic fields, which uh, seem to be ubiquitous in the corona. The problem, however, uh, we're facing is that we don't know how to get these waves to dissipate. Okay, so they're they propagating in the camera uh, in the corona, but they are not giving up their energy. So even in the corona, which is already hot, you can still see these waves to be propagating. Okay, the other. Uh, proposed mechanism is based on something called magnetic reconnection, which is being sort of uh, shown in this animation. So you push uh, opposing, oppositely directed magnetic fields together as shown by these vertical arrows. And at some point under certain conditions, when it comes very close to each other, it can snap and reconnect. Uh, so the topology of the magnetic field can change. And some of the energy which is lost in the dissipation of that magnetic field appears as heat in the uh, local region. So again, this is driven by the fact that there are all these convective motions in the footprints of magnetic fields, which are going to tangle these magnetic fields very badly. And you can think of these magnetic fields as rubber bands, right? As I twist them and churn them and so on, I'm increasing the stress in them. And they will come a point beyond which they will not be able to sustain that stress. And magnetic fields, unlike let's say a wire or a rubber band, they cannot break they can only reconnect. And this becomes their salvation to reduce their stress and uh, give the uh, excess energy which they were carrying to the plasma medium there. Okay. In fact, this magnetic reconnection we know is responsible for some of the most dramatic explosions which take place on the sun. These are the most violent explosions in our solar system, actually. So this is the same geometry which uh, you were seeing in the animation earlier. There is some sort of a magnetic field loop which has come out of this corona. The places where these uh, horizontal red, red arrows are, that is where this magnetic field is being sort of pushed towards each other by the ambient medium. And the reconnection is happening at this point. And the, the material which is uh, sitting here is now being energized, is becoming more energetic, is being heated up, and that is being pushed out both outwards and inwards towards the sun. In fact, a similar uh, uh, image, I think it, sh it shows things a little more clearly. So here is a magnetic field loop, which was emerging, which had emerged from the sun. On top of it was maybe another pre-existing loop. And these could be the places where the magnetic reconnection is happening. And as this happens, and there are these energetic particles sitting beneath this loop, uh, which are trying to move out, this whole structure gets thrown out of the sun. Okay. And these are what are referred to as coronal mass ejections. And what I'm showing you here is uh, some of the most spectacular CMEs which took place uh, in the previous solar cycle. In fact, they took place close to the Halloween uh, uh, celebrated in US. And so they got named as the Halloween CMEs here. Okay, And I will actually play this movie again. So 
what you're seeing is a sort of artificial eclipse of the sun and these wisps which are moving out are these coronal mass ejections and suddenly you will find that uh, this image will begin to look like a TV set from the 70s like you see now. And that is because these really energetic plasma which was uh, thrown out from the sun happened to be directed towards this particular satellite. This particular satellite which is sitting uh, between the sun sitting on the sun earth line very close to the earth about a million and a half kilometers from the earth okay so uh, so these are what are referred to as coronal mass ejections these are ejections of very energetic plasma from the sun which has its magnetic field entrapped in them and is moving out in some particular direction uh, if they happen to, and here is uh, another animation which tries to show uh, the same thing. That was the CME which took place from the sun. It is now moving towards the earth. Uh, soon it will encounter the magnetosphere of the earth, which is shown by these lines around the earth. And most of the plasma has flown by the earth protected by its magnetosphere. But some of it uh, managed to reach the earth via reconnection. And that is what appears as the aurora on the northern and the uh, southern close to the northern and southern uh, magnetic poles right aurora uh, borealis and aurora australis in fact if you want to understand it in slightly more detail here is what is happening so this was this was the sun here was the cme cloud uh, the cloud of plasma which was flowing out imagine for a moment that its magnetic field was oriented like this and sitting here is the earth which is protected by its magnetic blanket called the magnetosphere and let's say this was the orientation of the uh, magnetic field in the magnetosphere now uh, sorry as this cloud of cme comes closer and closer and closer to the uh, earth it is going to find a magnetic field which is parallel to itself and we know that parallel magnetic fields repel so what is going to happen is that this uh, this energetic plasma is just going to sort of push into the magnetosphere. It's going to compress that a bit, but that plasma is not going to be able to flow into the magnetosphere. Instead, most of it will flow along the sides of the magnetosphere. Okay, And so we really won't feel too many harmful effects from this massive CME. On the other hand, if the magnetic field of this CME was oriented in the opposite direction. Now, when this guy comes close to Earth's magnetosphere, you will find that these two magnetic fields are sort of oppositely oriented and these can now interact. And that is where this magnetic reconnections will take place, which will create paths for this very energetic plasma of the CME to flow along the magnetic field lines. They will then come to the Earth's uh, northern and southern magnetic poles and create uh, geomagnetic storms create very large disturbances in the Earth's ionosphere, which have all sorts of uh, harmful impacts on us. And that's what is being summarized in this particular slide, uh, which talks about uh, where should I start? Okay, which talks about, for example, the currents which are being set up in the ionosphere because there is this massive amount of plasma which is flowing along these magnetic fields, which is setting up these currents. These currents, uh, in turn, can induce currents on the Earth, right? We have enormously long conductors laid all over the Earth in, in the form of our electricity grid. And if these ionospheric currents are able to induce currents in these, then that creates a problem for the grids. Uh, we are all used to using, say, GPS signals for navigation and so on. If those GPS signals have to pass through this ionospheric layer, they get sufficiently distorted that our GPS systems are actually unable to work. Uh, if you happen to be an airline passenger who's, say, flying from India to US, your uh, straight path, or let's say at least the east coast of US, your straight, straight path will take you pretty close to the North Pole. But that is the region where all these energetic plasma is going to come. So whenever uh, there is a danger of something like that happening, the airlines actually have to reroute uh, their flight paths and take much longer paths to reach their destinations. Uh, this, the additional plasma which is there in the in the higher atmosphere also creates atmospheric drag, increases the atmospheric drag for the satellites which are there. We now have uh, astronauts living on the space station all the time. It creates issues for them. So there's a bunch of different issues which one has to face because of these uh, CMEs. And they're all referred to now as space weather. Okay. The, and okay. So 
I'll jump on to a slightly different thread at this point. So we talked quite a bit about what the sun appears like at the higher frequency wavelengths, right, above uh, the optical. So going to shorter and shorter wavelengths above the optical frequencies. Let's take a look at what it what the sun appears like at radio frequencies. So now we have come, come down to the far end uh, on the low frequency side, which I was talking about earlier. Okay. So here are some images which uh, are at say the bottommost layer or bottommost row is at 17 gigahertz. The next one is at about 5.7. The topmost is at about 410 megahertz. Okay, these were taken. Uh, these are simultaneous in time. All these three images were taken at the same time, as were these, and so on and so forth. Okay, so what you can see here is essentially the. Here again, you can see the active regions appear as bright points here. And because these are on sort of almost successive days, you can see these things uh, move slightly because of rotation of the Earth. At a frequency of something like 5.7 gigahertz, you see a greater contrast between whatever is happening at active regions and the background sun. But if you were to look at this particular image at 410 megahertz, this looks dramatically different, right? Here again, the limb of the sun or the edge of the sun is shown by this thin white circle. And this emission seems to be coming from sort of well above that uh, disk of the sun as well. And in fact, there is this dark spot which is there, which seems to be rotating with the sun, for which you don't really have much evidence in, in these guys. And this is, in fact, uh, if I had shown you a picture of a higher energy thing, it would have been identified as a coronal hole there. And so the same coronal hole is visible in these radio wavelengths as well. Okay. I talked about an active and a quiet sun, and I was trying to show you on that plot how the active sun can be much, much brighter than the quiet sun. All I want you to notice from this image is the the look of this particular image of the sun and the color scale. This is 10 times 10 to the power 8 in units of uh, Kelvin, let's say, so 10 to the power 9. Okay, And on this one, you see the sun to be a uh, much more featureless thing, but its brightness is only something like 4 times 10 to the power 5 in units of uh, Kelvin. Okay, So what it is telling you that this small patch of emission which is coming from the sun here is something like 10,000 times brighter than what was coming from the rest of the sun. Okay, So this is how the appearance of the sun can change so dramatically. These are very comparable frequencies. This is 144 megahertz. This is 239 megahertz, really quite close by. But the sun at different times can appear dramatically different. And this can actually outshine the rest of the sun by a very large amount, by tens of thousands of times. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if you can hear the audio as well. This was just a, a Diwali card, which a student of mine had made out of real data from the MWA. All these flashes which you are seeing here, these are actually emissions from the sun, which were these are real emissions from the sun superposed on the real uh, 193 angstrom image, which is sensitive to about, uh, I think, about a million Kelvin or so. Uh, and these are really transient. Okay, These last typically from between half a second to a couple of seconds, and they're just all over the place, and they just come and go. Okay, These, we believe, are the things which are arising because of those magnetic reconnections, which I was talking to you about earlier. Not only it is the big uh, coronal mass ejections which arise because of these uh, magnetic reconnections. There is a small number of, uh, sorry, there's a huge number of very faint uh, radio flashes which are occurring all over the sun because of those magnetic reconnections. And those we believe are the, we now have good evidence that these are the things which could possibly be giving rise to coronal heating. Okay, now, uh, there's another thing about radio which I wanted to uh, talk to you about, which was to say that, uh, you know, we talked about space weather and how much harmful its impact could be on our uh, uh, on life on Earth. In fact, if you look at the British, something they call the risk registry, uh, a coronal mass ejection, a large coronal mass ejection is among the highest risks which they mentioned to their country. What I'm showing you here is a technique which can be actually used to predict the space weather. 
This has not yet been done, but I'm hoping that somebody from your generation uh, will do it. This is actually a, a real image of the sky taken during the daytime after the sun has been subtracted from it. Huh? This is a radio image. This is the place where the sun was. And all these uh, white dots which you see, these are other sources in the sky. And this is a cartoon which shows the CME, which would have been, for example, coming towards the Earth. Okay. Now, the idea is the following. You are probably familiar with something called Faraday rotation, that as I pass linearly polarized light through magnetized plasma, its plane of polarization changes. And how much it changes depends on the strength of the magnetic field in that medium and the electron density. Okay, so if I have the CME, which I know has both a strong magnetic field as well as is carrying a lot of plasma, in my sky, I have many polarized sources, which I can see. As this thing is crossing my line of sight, if I was measuring the polarization of all those sources in the background, I would see all those polarization vectors change. As using that change in a plane of polarization, I could figure out by how much uh, or how much magnetic field and how much electron density is required to produce that change. And that I can use to measure the vector magnetic field of the CME. If I can do this before the CME has come, come close to the Earth, then I can make a prediction. Then the satellite owners, for example, can put their satellites in safe modes. I can tell uh, the people who rely on GPS receivers that please expect a disruption. The airline industry will know that how to reroute their uh, uh, flight paths, the, the electricity companies will know that they should be careful with the electricity grids because something like this is going to happen. So this is a huge uh, uh, so potential societal impact which one could do. And that's something which we are working towards, though we are still quite far away from achieving that. Okay. So uh, in the, la the last thing I really wanted to, to talk about was to say that even though, you know, we regard the sun as something we take for granted, right? Comes up every day, we know what it looks like. Uh, this, you probably have a feeling that there is nothing new or nothing more to be learned about the sun, but the sun continues to host many, many unsolved problems. And I'm listing just two of them. One I discussed in some detail, the coronal heating problem. The other one is about particle acceleration at shocks. I uh, don't quite have the time to get into that. Also, interestingly, for those of you who are interested in physics, the sun offers uh, the problems which the outstanding problems for the sun, they require a range of different physics to be understood. So from particle physics to hydrodynamics to magneto hydrodynamics and plasma physics and electromagnetics, and you really are dealing with very intricate data requiring really very complex and cutting edge data analysis. And the fact that this is a very exciting field should also be evident to you by simply the fact that many new observatories have either just come into operation or are planned for near future uh, to address some of the solar physics problems, right? And the fact that uh, we now have the ability, much more computational ability than we have ever had, and it is much more affordable than it ever was, which means that entire classes of problems which were previously uh, uh, impossible to attempt are now within reach, right? So this is a really exciting time for solar physics. We really expect in the next decade or so to be, uh, to be significant progress in understanding some of these fundamental things. So for those of you who are thinking of careers in science, I would really like to put, put to you this idea of thinking about uh, solar physics as one of the things you might consider. And with that, I think I'll uh, just want to thank you for your time and attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Professor Divya, for uh, taking us through that walk of invisibility. There are a huge number of questions. And so uh, as uh, uh, there are also a lot of other chat messages, which please, to the participants, you make it very difficult for us to retain all the questions huh, and get them answered. I had to just constantly screen save the screen and put it in paint all right so now what i will do is i will uh, share maybe that but uh, okay. meanwhile i will also some of the questions are still accessible so i mm -hmm. will um, uh, first flash them on the screen divya okay if, so i can uh, stop sharing uh, you, yeah. are, you are you are in the uh, studio 
uh tab you will be able to see the questions that i will yes. flash yeah uh eh bachcha log you are constantly messaging unnecessary messages i am not able to there are so many very good questions which have come uh okay this is uh, i yeah I, i are you able to see divya i'm just trying to fish yes. out the questions yeah, yeah. right right i see this one why do uh, alpha waves do not easily dissipate energy in the corona right yeah so that's uh, that was exactly the reason why people were so uh, uh, gung ho about looking for alpha waves now it turns out for reasons which are actually not very easy for me to explain either that these alpha waves are very hard to to dissipate they uh, the dissipation modes which one has to activate to get the energy out of them they just don't seem to occur naturally in the in the coronal plasma once set into oscillation they just continue to oscillate huh? i'm sorry this is not uh, something i can give you a, a very detailed answer on but that just happens to be the nature of this uh, these waves so there are actually a number of questions which you would have touched upon in your talk but there are still there sure. So maybe yeah. we could take them up too. Sure. This so the next one I see that. here is from Amit Shrivastava, which is uh, which says, "What is solar star?" Right. So yeah. uh, I think there there are many different answers you could find to that. Uh, some of the common ones are that something called the coronal mass ejection, when a huge amount of plasma is being thrown out from the sun. It, typically it follows something called a big solar flare which is an enormous brightening of the sun in uh, extreme ultraviolet and uh, uh, x rays also uh, it has some associated emissions at radio frequencies and then there is this enormous amount of plasma which is something like a trillion kilograms which is just shot out uh, into the medium at speeds of up to 2000 kilometers a second uh, that is often referred to as a solar storm but in different context you will think of many other answers as well yeah. okay how does magnetic reconnection related to uh, solar cycle from anchit goel yeah okay so what happens in uh, in different phases of the solar cycle is that different amounts of magnetic field is emerging from the surface of the sun it is only the magnetic field which has emerged from the photosphere which can actually undergo magnetic reconnection okay so because the amount of magnetic field which is available for magnetic reconnection is larger closer to the solar maximas that is where a lot of this uh, uh, magnetic reconnection is happening and uh, something which i forgot to emphasize earlier in my talk all that high energy plasma all that million, 10 million kelvin plasma and so on and so forth all of that is being heated up by magnetic reconnection that there is no doubt about okay so uh, at closer to solar maximas there is much more magnetic field which is out there in the photosphere more magnetic reconnections and hotter the sun yeah uh can sunspots combine okay this is from urmila sharma uh so sunspots can sometimes combine uh imagine uh, there is a loop which is coming out from the sun and maybe there was another loop which was coming out somewhere else on the sun and just because of the convective motions on the uh, on the surface of the sun both things are possible it is possible for one sunspot to fragment into many smaller sunspot pairs or some larger sunspot pairs to also combine into uh, a smaller number of sunspot pairs are all rays of the sun harmful uh, that's from charanpreet kaur well we owe our life to the sun if the plants on the earth were not getting the sunlight we would not exist right so clearly all rays from the sun cannot be harmful the other thing is that we live under the blanket of an atmosphere the atmosphere uh, screens off like i was showing in an earlier plot all the uh, rays at frequencies uh, below infrared and ultraviolet and above they are simply don't make it to the surface of the earth the ultraviolet rays would have been the harmful rays if they were incident on the skin of our earth or skin of uh, our bodies but they never make it to the surface because of the atmosphere which we have so when people say don't look at the sun directly that is simply because the sun is such a bright source that our eyes are not designed to look at it apart from that the sun is not uh, is not giving out any harmful rays to 
those of us who are on the surface of the earth. Can the ultraviolet rays coming from the sun uh, okay, I'm not sure yeah, I understood. Very, very clear. Yeah, maybe you may want to. Uh, other is meanwhile, I will post uh, this question, which probably we should. Could you elaborate on correlation at radio with solar maxima and minima? Sure. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Gitanjali, for the question. That's something which I did not talk about uh, at all in my. Thing. Now, it so happens that the same electrons which are energized by magnetic reconnections, which you see at, uh, say, temperatures of a million Kelvin or even hundreds of thousands of Kelvin, the same electrons are also responsible for giving out radiation in the radio part of the spectrum, but using very different emission mechanisms. Okay, So it so happens that uh, the radio wavelength in the radio wavelength also the sun is much brighter during uh, solar maxima. And those emissions are very uh, patchy, both in time and where they take place. So the background radio sun remains the same, whether you are at the minima or the maxima. But because of the presence of a large number of active regions, the same magnetic reconnections, uh, the energized electrons from them also give rise to radio emissions. Divya, uh, uh -huh. I was noticing you are having a little uh, throat uh, issue. No, Is it okay? There are a number of questions. Is it okay to go ahead now or um, should we? No, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. I just okay. needed some water, I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like the sun has enough mass to deform space time around it, uh, does it presumably. Uh, okay. So that's a question from Kiran Mehta, which basically says that can the sun's magnetic field also affect the electromagnetic radiation from the stars behind it? Uh, I don't believe that is uh, that happens. Also, on the bulk of the sun, the magnetic field is not uh, very large. It's about a Gauss or so. And on the sunspots where it becomes, or active regions where it is strongest, it goes to a few thousand Gauss. Yep. There are many other uh, objects in our universe which have much, much stronger magnetic fields. And Ratnashri has been working on some of them for uh, for a long time, too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Neutral yeah. star. There is, there is yeah. a question from a student, I think, who may have been confused by false color images. So I thought maybe it will be good to ah, take this. OK. Ah, very good. Thanks. Yeah. So uh, OK, so I should. I should have again said something maybe during my talk. See, what we perceive as colors is limited to what our eyes can see, right? So for the visible part of the spectrum, there is a red and a green and a yellow and an orange and so on. For anything else, uh, it is the choice of the person who's making the image to give a color to that, right? So what your instrument is measuring really is that at any given wavelength, what is the intensity of light which is coming from some particular direction or some particular point on the sun? And I would typically give a brighter color to a higher intensity and a darker color to a lower intensity. Now, whether I make it red or green or blue is really my choice. Huh? So don't associate a color with it in the sense of the color we associate in the optical part of the spectrum. It, what it is showing you is which regions are brighter at that particular wavelength of light and which regions are fainter. Uh, okay, what is magnetic reconnection? So magnetic reconnection, like I was saying earlier, is a way for magnetic field to shed some of its energy when it becomes really too high. So what happens to a rubber band if you keep twisting it, twisting it, twisting it, it'll eventually break, right? If you imagine the magnetic fields to also be like rubber bands, and as you twist them, there is in fact an analogous concept of magnetic tension which builds inside them. And given the properties of the medium in which they take place, in which uh, this magnetic field is sitting, they have different uh, thresholds beyond which they cannot sustain this magnetic stress. So at the first opportunity which becomes available to it, when some oppositely directed magnetic fields come close to each other, it tries to relieve that stress. So it is like if uh, maybe some magnetic, there were magnetic strands which were going, say, opposite to each other, but at some distance, they would suddenly connect to each other, maybe something like this, changing the topology of the magnetic field. And in the process, 
a lot of this stress of the energy, a lot of those twists and turns which would have been formed would be uh, shed. The, the energy in that would be used up to just heat the plasma at the location where this magnetic reconnection is taking place. Now, it, it is surprising, but the really fine details of this magnetic reconnection process are still being understood here. Yeah? Uh, when will the next solar cycle occur? So then uh, we have already started the next solar cycle. Uh, the previous solar cycle was actually very weak as compared to some of the previous ones. And we had more than 100 days without a sunspot uh, on the surface of the sun. But the first sunspots of the new solar cycle have already started to appear. Uh, I don't know whether you want to take this question about a whole <laughs> Okay. What is hydrodynamics? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, so hydro relates to fluids, right? The things which can flow. That is what hydro aspect of that word deals with. Dynamics is about motion, right? So hydrodynamics is the field of study which tries to figure out how would a fluid move. So like in any other case, like in mechanics, or if I have, let's say, this cell phone on my hand, if I put some force, apply some force to it, it will move. Similarly, if I had some, some fluid parcel, some packet of fluid, uh, its motion would be governed by what all forces are acting on it. And the study of how do fluids move when forces act on them is referred to as hydrodynamics. So this would include both liquids and gases. Yeah. Uh, the, the sun changes its color according to the temperature. Is it true? So this is from Medha Kishore. OK, uh, so it's fair to say that the color of a star depends on its temperature. So the sun appears yellow because the peak uh, at which its emission lies, lies in the yellow green region of the sun. If there is a hotter sun, it will a hotter star. Sorry, it would appear blue. If there was a cooler star, it would appear red and so on. So the sun itself, um, I think what you meant perhaps was a star rather than the sun in your question. And that is indeed true. Uh, that's a very good question from Himanshu Chauhan. Is the sunspot really a hole? No, it is not. Okay, so uh, sunspot is the place from where just a large amount of magnetic field is erupting from the sun. Now, uh, if you remember, I had told you that in that layer of the sun, the energy is being transported to the surface of the sun by convection. Okay, whenever wherever there are these strong magnetic fields, this convection is suppressed, which means that the energy cannot come from the bottom of the this convective layer to the top. That is what leads to the sunspot becoming cooler as far as the optical wavelengths are concerned. That is why it looks dark as compared to its neighboring regions. But this is a place which is really dense with magnetic fields. And when these interactions between these magnetic fields happen, they uh, from this magnetic reconnection, they generate plasma at very high temperatures. Now, the volumes or the amounts of that plasma is not very large, but the temperature of that plasma is very high. So it's not really a hole. It is just a cooler place on the sun. What are the main components of the sun? OK, in terms of elements, the vast majority of the sun is uh, hydrogen. The next most abundant element is helium. I would. Uh, have to Google quickly to give you the the numbers for what the relative compositions are. But the sun also has a small amount of trace uh, elements which are there. Right? These are just few few uh, percent, I think, order a couple of percent at most, which would be there. Yeah. Uh, okay. Seventy three percent hydrogen, twenty five percent helium, and about two percent of uh, everything else. And again, the most abundant amongst them are oxygen, carbon, neon, and iron. Yeah. There are a number of school students, even some very younger ones. So there are going to be some questions. Uh, there was also a question about what is Kelvin. But I did answer it. Oh. So maybe we can skip okay. it for now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to answer many because there were so many questions and so many sure. extra messages. <laughs> Not a problem. So the one which just flashed by was what is Corona? Right, yeah. OK, so uh, like we were talking about earlier, so with our eyes, we see the visible disk of the sun. 
if you have seen a picture of the uh, picture of the sun taken during a solar eclipse of the sorts which I had shown earlier, you see a lot of diffuse light right, coming from around the sun. That is really the corona of the sun. Corona is just the Greek word which means crown. And so somehow that is the name which got stuck for, for this uh, medium or this part of the sun. But this is really very hot gas, which is at about a couple of million Kelvin or degrees centigrade, if you prefer, which is surrounding the sun. Uh, and that's all it is here. Yeah. Is the light of sun also made up of Wibgeor? Absolutely, yeah. So that's an experiment which uh, maybe you have already done in the lab or you might do at some point, just pass the sunlight through a prism and see it split into the seven colors. We think of only the seven colors because that's all our eyes can see, right? If you had, uh, if you were to do it with a device which could split many other colors as well, and if you had devices to measure them, you would see many more colors, infrared and below and ultraviolet and beyond. Yeah. How much magnetic force does a sunspot produce? Uh, so maybe a better way to ask that question is, uh, and this is from Manoj, Manoj Menon, uh, is better way to ask that question is, uh, how much magnetic field is there in a sunspot? And maybe the simplest way to answer that, that is can be a few thousand times uh, that in the region where there are no sunspots. And as compared to the quiet parts of the sun, it can be a few thousand times here. Yeah. How does the ozone layer protect us from the harmful rays of the sun? Okay. Uh, okay. So what happens basically is that uh, when some uh, when ultraviolet rays are incident on the atmosphere of the sun, they actually ionize some of the uh, some of the gases which are present in the higher up in the atmosphere. What is the process of ionization? Process of ionization is that I have a neutral uh, atom here or a molecule here. On this is incident some very high energy uh, electromagnetic radiation, which is going to kick out one of the electrons from there. And in the process of doing that, that electromagnetic ray has lost its energy and that has been used up in ionizing this, uh, this particular atom. It is by doing this, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that is how, and this ozone is eventually formed from these ionized oxygen, which is uh, produced in the atmosphere. And that is, so it's not really the ozone layer, which is protecting us, but it is the fact that the ionization has taken place, which has led to the formation of ozone, which is protecting us. Yeah. I was just saying one of the participants, Himanshu Chauhan has tried to, answer this question in a little qualitative way. So I was just appreciating okay, that. Yeah. And the next question is Aditi Gurks. Uh, do all solar activities impact on Earth? Uh, so you could say yes or no. If something, let's say things like the coronal mass ejections, if they are not directed towards the Earth, they don't bother us, right? They are, in fact, only a very small fraction of the things which are thrown out from the Earth from the sun come to the earth. Most of them go in many other different directions. So those ones don't particularly bother us. Uh, in terms of space weather, only a small fraction of what happens on the sun impacts us here. Yeah. Though this has been discussed, the question has been coming up. Uh, uh, okay, what is solar is minimum it? and maximum? Uh, yeah. So, okay. so if you remember uh, from one of the slides which I had earlier on where I was trying to show how many sunspots appear on the sun at, a, at any time. And if you were to just track this, every day count the number of sunspots which are there on the sun and keep doing that day after day, month after month, year after year, you'll find that this number of solar uh, sunspots which are appearing on the sun, they rise for a while, for many years, and then they fall for many years, and then they again rise for many years, and so on and so forth. And the distance or the time between the first maxima and the second maxima is about 11 years. Okay, And this is what is called the solar cycle. And the peak of the solar cycle, where you have the largest number of sunspots, is called the solar maximum. And the place where you have the smallest number of sunspots is called the solar minimum. 
very interesting question by Rekha Liyal. OK. As the sun reaches its later phases of life, does mm -hmm. the number of sunspot uh, is also increasing? And if yes, why? OK. So I'm not sure if I'm really qualified to answer that question, but I can say a few things. OK. So uh, the sun, like I said, is, uh, is about 9 million years old. And we have, even though I said we have been observing the sun for hundreds of years, as far as the life of the sun is concerned, it's a really not even a blink of an eye, right? Yeah. So from an observational perspective, we can't really answer the question if the number of, uh, if the solar activity or sunspots are going to change as the sun ages or not. Uh, I think over the lifetime of human civilization, it will probably not see much difference here. Yeah. Although this was, uh, you you talked about it, good deal, but still the question is there. Okay. So maybe. Uh, is should. there any way of predicting solar flares or CMEs in advance uh, by doing some mathematical modeling? If yes, how actually such modeling works? Okay, that's a really interesting question. And there is, in fact, uh, a lot of work which is being done towards that. So the idea is the following, that we know that what eventually gets thrown out as the CMEs is really the magnetic field which has erupted from the sun, right? So if we keep track of all the magnetic field which is erupting out from the photosphere and keep track of how much stress is building up in it, and we should eventually be able to say that, okay, now in this particular magnetic structure, which is located at this point on the sun, enough stress has built out that it we now expect it to erupt at some point. Okay, So a lot of people have been putting in enormous amount of effort in pursuing this idea. While the as an idea, it still seems promising, but we are not yet able to do it. Okay, We find uh, places where based on all our experience and uh, analysis, we would expect things to erupt, but they don't. And we find places where we were never expecting things to erupt and they actually give rise to pretty strong eruptions. So there is still a lot to be understood there, but yes, work is ongoing on this. I don't know that there's a typo in the last word and uh, is- uh... No, that's SOT was the name of the instrument, yeah. Okay, okay. oh, sorry. So, okay, uh... yeah, yeah. Huh. So, uh, so, White light simply means the uh, the range of wavelengths which we can see with our eyes. And that was a solar optical telescope. That was the name of the instrument on board a satellite by the name Hinode. Hinode means sunrise in Japanese, I think. Yeah. So yeah, they just had an optical camera and the image which they make from that was the SOT image. What is a geomagnetic force? So. Uh, it's not really a specific kind of force, but uh, like I had shown in one of the slides, the Earth has a magnetic field blanket around it, right? The Earth's magnetosphere. We know, for example, that we can use compass for navigation on Earth. That is because Earth has a magnetic field which uh, makes this compass align and so on. So this field of the Earth is called the geomagnetic field. And anything which uh, interacts with that uh, get is exerting a force on this geomagnetic field. I put okay. the second question as it is related. Yeah. In a way. yeah. So how is yes? How is aurora formed uh, from Amit again? Yeah. Okay. So what we see as aurora is really uh, high energy particles from accelerated uh, from or from somewhere in the solar wind, which have somehow found their way to the magnetic poles of the Earth. Okay. So. These particles actually come from the solar wind. So they are solar in origin. Uh, they're still traveling very fast. And when they uh, bombard the Earth's atmosphere, they give rise, they actually ionize some of the uh, oxygen and other molecules in the atmosphere and give rise to these beautiful lights here. So the lights come from the fact that this high energy, high energy particles are ionizing particles in the Earth's uh, atmosphere. Can you please illuminate us about helioseismology? OK, uh, that's something which I did not talk about at all because I was just trying to uh, talk only about electromagnetic uh, radiation. So uh, seismology, as you all know, is the study of, uh, well, we think of it as study of earthquakes on the, on the Earth, but it is really the study of 
uh, propagation of waves through the earth. Similarly, helioseismology is the same uh, study applied to the sun. And what people have found is that even though we think of the sun as really a stable uh, body, which is sort of rotating on its axis and going around, uh, well, the galaxy in this case, it is actually also oscillating. Okay, And so if you were to make very precise measurements of how each patch on the surface of the sun is moving radially, you can get information about these modes of oscillations of the sun. And it is, in fact, using these uh, helioseismology helio studies that we have figured out in great detail the structure of the sun. If you remember, I started by saying we have a core at this temperature, and then we have a radiative zone and a convective zone, and so on and so forth. So a lot of the information which uh, I presented there came from helioseismology studies. Can there be a big enough sunspot on sun or another star which actually reduces the overall luminosity and affects the planet's weather? Uh, indeed, it it can be, right? So the uh, so the optical emission from the sun does get reduced as the uh, number of sun star sun spots increases. But what also happens is that from these sun spots comes more energetic emission in extreme UV and X rays and so on. So if you look at the total uh, amount of energy which is being emitted. Uh, it is really variable in the extreme UV and X-ray because that is entirely dependent on the presence of the active regions. But uh, in the optical light, the variability is much less because in most of the active, in most of the, let me not say that, on our sun, it is not a large impact, but there are indeed uh, stars which are being studied where people believe that the active regions are large enough that they are giving rise to a variation which we can measure from Earth, uh, which is coming because of the active regions on these stars. Uh, there are some questions in the, I've saved from a very early, right? There was a question at that time also, what is the core of the sun? So since it's related, I am... Uh Sure. So the, the core of the sun, as in the core of any object, is the deepest innermost uh, part of the sun, right? So that is the innermost densest part of the sun. It is also the hottest part of the sun. It's at a temperature of about 15 million Kelvin or degrees centigrade as compared to the surface, which is at about 6000 centigrade there. Uh, that answer this question too. Uh, do Maybe we do want to take this question because there are a number of... Uh, oh, sorry, my mouse is hovering over. Uh, are you? <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, maybe sometimes I'm clicking something which okay. while it is scrolling up, it's scrolling up. <coughs> ah, yeah, there is another question about sunspots. Very nice. I will put that later. So, uh, sure. So I have one question on the screen. If ha, ha, space ha. is on a large enough scale, a vacuum, why is there a notion of a heliopause? Okay. So uh, that's an interesting question. So uh, I'm thinking of what's the best way for me to approach it. Okay. So it is true that let's say okay at the top of the earth's atmosphere the solar wind which is incident on the earth its density is about eight particles per centimeter cube okay that is much less than the best vacuum which we can create in terrestrial labs nonetheless uh, even though this is very close to a vacuum but there is the pressure which is uh, exerted by the solar wind is significant enough that it modifies the shape of Earth's magnetosphere. Similarly, if you keep following this solar wind further and further out, somewhere it is going to go and, and meet what is called now the uh, interstellar medium, right? And the boundary of these two will lie at a place where these two things are able to exert equal and opposite pressure on each other, right? So, and it so happens that, uh, uh, the first two man-made objects have now actually crossed into, crossed outside this region of heliosphere into the region of interplanetary uh, magnetic field. Uh, I'm blanking out on the name of these satellites. Uh, Voyager, Voyager 1 and 2. Both of these have now passed through 
passed beyond the heliosphere and are now in interstellar medium here. Yeah. So the number densities are very slow. For us, you could regard them as vacuums. But even though they are small, they're still there. Yeah. Why do sunspots not occur on poles? That's, again, a very interesting question. So it has the answer uh, actually comes from the field of uh, something called solar dynamo, which is about, uh, in fact, it turns out that you have to keep doing something to keep generating these magnetic fields on the sun. and the way this solar dynamo works is that it is possible for the, the strongest uh, that these eruptions of the magnetic fields, they tend to take place only in equatorial in, in sort of latitude belts from around plus minus five to plus minus 35 or so degrees latitude. Okay. I realize I'm not giving you a great answer, but it's a very complicated answer and I don't think we can get into that now, but it comes from the physics of the solar dynamo. Yeah? Uh, it's related. You touched up on it, but this question came immediately after okay. that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So that's again something which I did not talk about myself, and that is also related to the solar dynamo. So I had been talking all along of an eleven-year solar cycle, but if you were to look at things more closely, actually it turns out that the solar cycle should be twenty-two years, because what also happens is that every eleven years the north and south pole of the sun flip. So if I'm going to count my cycle as from one north pole, so, so field being say oriented towards north at the solar north to the next time it is oriented in the same direction, it will actually be 22 years. Again, the answer to this comes from the way the magnetic dynamo works, which uh, sort of flips the polarity every uh, 11 years. Uh, yeah, that's probably the right thing for me to say at this point. What keeps the sun spinning? Actually, you should ask the question the other way around. So you've, you're you all uh, familiar with Newton's laws of motion, right? And you know that any body on which no force, no external force is acting would continue to be in its state of rest or motion. So if the sun is already spinning, if you wanted it to stop spinning, you would have to do something. Okay? If you don't do anything, it will just keep spinning. So that is what is happening to the spun, sun as well here. Yeah? I'm now sharing from the very early questions which were there. Of course, the, most of them were perhaps by the school students who may have. Uh, so they, they were surprised about the invisibleness of the sun. But anyway, that the talk touched upon. Let me just see if there are any questions in that which... Um, sure. Yeah, there was uh, some... I think some of them had heard that there are some recent sunspot excitement. So the number of people were asking whether any sunspots found recently. So, so there were some, uh, the excitement related to that came from the fact that the first sunspots of the new cycle were reported some time back here. Hmm. So that is, I, I guess that would be the context in which uh, they would have found yeah, some news. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Rishu Raj was asking, since the sun is like 99% mass of solar system, if you move the sun, then will it move the whole solar system with it? Uh, <laughs> So like you said, the sun is 99.9% .9 of the mass of the sun. If you move the sun, naturally the, the solar system will move with it. Move with it yeah. But I mean, I, I'm not sure what do you have in mind. Uh, if you were to just drag the sun to some other place, <laughs> yes, all the other planets are gravitationally bound to it. They, they are going to follow that. Yeah. Uh, there is There was someone who kept asking a lot in the beginning, which country found the first invisible sun? So that would have been from the uh, Jansky. <laughs> yes, uh, right. Yeah, that could be. So, yeah. So the very birth of radio astronomy was related to discovering the uh, invisible sun. Yeah. So okay. if you have to look for a country, that would be the US. Yeah. Okay. I think that many of these questions were later repeated. So they were answered. Uh, somebody said, is sun black in actuality? Uh, well, we see it. I mean, uh, we see the light from the sun all the time, right? So the the sun is really bright yellow. If you want to think of it like that, yeah. Just now, somebody has asked, "What is chromosphere?" I I hope. Oh, okay. actually, while I'm hovering on the question, it moves, so I'm speaking the wrong one. But someone wanted to know about the chromosphere, which I thought maybe you would like to. Uh, 
So, okay. So, uh, chromosphere is a thin layer uh, on top of the the visible disk of the sun, which we call the photosphere. If you, I don't know, I did not point it out when I showed that picture, but if you were to look at one of those eclipse pictures, it had some really thin red things which were there at the edges. That is what the chromosphere looks like uh, at an eclipse. Uh, it's a pretty dense layer. It is at a temperature of about 10,000 Kelvin. Yeah. yeah that's there is one is. question maybe if before we stop, which has come about because of the bad language astronomers use. Oh. <laughs> Why does sun not run out of the oxygen as it burns? Ah, okay. Well, uh, so even though we say that the sun burns, it is not burning uh, in the conventional sense of uh, burning we use on earth right so on the earth certainly we need oxygen for anything to burn but what sun is doing is actually fusing two atoms of hydrogen to produce an atom of helium and it so happens that the weight of the uh, helium atom which is produced is just very slightly less than that of the two hydrogen atoms which went into producing that and it is this small difference in mass which is released as the energy so the sun does not require any oxygen to to burn right that's just a colloquial <coughs> sorry like ratna she said that is just a poor choice of words yeah in describing how the sun produces its energy. Yeah. There are a few other questions which are a little more about, I think, I mean, more positional astronomy related in a way. So maybe we will we will take that up in a later session where I will uh, uh, deal with positional astronomy aspects. Is that okay? The, when somebody yeah, wants yeah, to know sure. what is a lunar eclipse, somebody wants to know why is sun colder okay. in winter, which of course Himanshu answered to some extent, but maybe we will have a session where we can see that. Okay. Uh, sure, yeah. uh, Amit, where you are asking how large is sun from Earth, you probably want to know what is its angular diameter like. And um, so, I mean, it's about shall half we, a degree. Yeah, yeah half a degree. Yeah. And we've been doing sessions where we actually help students measure this and so on. So I thought sure, maybe, yeah. I hope all of you will be there in, the, they will do one other session, a little um, related to all these positional aspects. And what is the speed of dark? Somebody says, "What is this?" Yes, yeah. Not clear. Not clear what the question is. I don't know yeah. if I've left any because there were so many messages that I may have uh, missed a couple of questions. If they have been missed, quickly type them now before we end the broadcast. Type them again if a question has been missed. And um, thank you so much for the patience with which you answered all the questions and all of you who asked all these nice very energizing questions. Thank you. And I just want to mention to schools, please do not force students to attend this. Some of them have been saying how long and all that, and they're very young children. They're finding it difficult to understand. So <laughs> whereas, I mean, we would, um, I mean, as long as this goes, it's fine because there are so many questions which are out there. So, uh, yeah. Okay. There is one other question here. Yes. Uh, Okay, with respect to the galactic velocity vector of the sun, is the cosmological velocity vector known? So, uh, I guess you could go to the the next level, right? So, like you said, the sun is going around the center of our galaxy and that speed we know reasonably well. Similarly, our galaxy is going around a local group of galaxies. And even though I myself don't know the answer to that question, the astronomy community knows the answer to uh, how our galaxy is going around our uh, within our local group of galaxies. At the level beyond that, I don't think we have the answer to that yet. So. Okay, so probably we have all the questions have been in. The sound travel faster in space, it would not at all travel. And there was a question about how many Earths would fit in Sun, part of that earlier question which somebody has answered. So, okay. great, yeah. Uh, Okay, I think so. That's uh, that, that. That's it. We'll be ending the broadcast here. Thank you so much for this. Thanks a lot. And, thanks uh, a lot. And uh, maybe we thanks may to all the participants. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I'm ending the broadcast here. If there are further.